All right. Uh, happy Monday and uh, welcome to the Berman Institute of Bioethics seminar series. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Liza Dawson um, to speak with us today. She is Chief of Bioethics, the IRB Chair, and the Research Integrity Officer at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, or RARE. Um, within bioethics, Dr. Dawson's main interests and work are in the area of clinical trial design, community engagement, the intersection of research and public health activities, and oversight of human research. Prior to joining RARE in 2019, uh, Dr. Dawson spent 16 years at the NIH, including 11 years at NIAID, and three years in the Office of Science Policy of the Office of the Director. But of course, the most important thing is that prior to that, um, she studied molecular biology and public health and received a PhD at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health and received a Master of Arts in Philosophy and Social Policy from GW. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, sometimes I mumble. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about, let me just get rid of this thing on the screen. I'm going to talk about um, upper limits on uh, risks in research. Um, this is really a work in progress, and you'll be able to tell as I go through it that it's there's some thinking that I haven't really finished. And uh, so I really welcome discussion and any kind of challenges or questions you have. also want to mention that my colleague, Dr. Jake Earl, who's in the audience, um, has, <laughs> has worked uh, with me thinking about some of these issues. Um, and I really appreciate his, his input and his uh, feedback. However, this presentation is just, just reflects my thoughts at the moment. Um, and maybe we'll hear from him if he agrees or disagrees as I go along. So um, I have to say this uh, mandatory disclaimer that this doesn't represent my employer's views, only my own. Um, so I wanna talk about how, why, how did we get interested in thinking about risks and upper limits of, of risk in research? And most of you probably heard about sort of a controversial proposal to do COVID challenge studies uh, when the pandemic was uh, expanding and we didn't yet have vaccines. Challenge studies, as I think you probably know, but just to make sure, um, they involve enrolling uh, volunteers where half the volunteers, for example, would get an experimental vaccine and half could receive a placebo. And, and then people would be exposed to the virus, in this case, in a laboratory setting, so deliberately infected, in order to determine the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, so this was a proposal that was made uh, by Nir Ayala, a bioethicist, and some other colleagues, saying that the value of doing a, t a, a trial like this um, would be tremendous uh, because it would save time developing vaccines, it would lead to saving lives, um, and that this should be considered sort of an ethical imperative. So this engendered a big debate um, about was this too risky? Would people understand the risks? Uh, would the promised value of the research to uh, hasten the arrival of vaccines and save lives from COVID infection, would that truly materialize? And so um, Jake and I, uh, along with another colleague, joined the fray and wrote a commentary about this, along with a lot of people. There were many, many pe papers written and commentaries published talking about this debate um, and were the risks justified how high were the risks? Were they justified? Um, and people on both sides weighed in. So this kind of raised the question, well, when are the risks of a non-therapeutic or non-beneficial study too high? So that's the question that I wanna talk about today. So um, <clears throat> should there be upper limits on risks in non-beneficial research? And I'll talk about what I mean by non-beneficial. Uh, if there are limits, what are the what's the justification for them, and what should the limits be? So, just to talk uh, to clarify what I'm talking about in terms of the types of benefits of research. As we all know, we have to balance benefits and risks in research with human participants, their risks and burdens to the people, and then their 
potentially direct benefits to the people in clinical research and other types of studies, and then indirect benefits, which we often refer to as social value, of the knowledge gained and the application of that knowledge to health concerns. So the type of studies I'm going to talk about today are the ones that don't have any direct benefits for people. They have only the knowledge gained or social value type of benefits. And we have to decide how much risk is ethically acceptable in these studies. Um, so the first argument that people make, or one of the first arguments people make when they want to say that we should have no limits on risk is that uh, is this appeal to the autonomous, autonomous authorization of people who join the trials. That is, in a sort of a free liberal society, we let people decide for themselves what type of risks they would like to undertake. Um, and, uh, you know, with limits, obviously, when, when the, there's a negative or impact on the interests of others. But in this case, the impact is um, allegedly positive. This is a people taking risks for altruistic reasons to help other people, to benefit society. So um, if people are fully informed and they we can verify that they understand the risks and they uh, comprehend what they're getting into and they freely choose, why should we stop them? That's one of the first arguments. So there are reasons we might stop them. Um, so um, Frank Miller and Steve Joffe wrote a paper in 2009 about limits in research. It was long before the COVID controversy about whether there should be upper limits. And they, they say that paternalism in research and that is limiting the kind of risks people would take is actually justified for, for two main reasons. One is that people don't always make good decisions about, that reflect their values and interests. There's defects in decision-making that are well known. Um, even when people are given information, despite all our best efforts, despite informed consent, et cetera, so um, with very risky studies, people might make decisions that actually aren't what they truly believe is best for them um, due to these failures in the decisional process. And part of that difficulty about research is that research is highly technical and difficult to understand, and it's not something that a lay person can necessarily readily grasp. So paternalism is warranted, said Miller and Jaffe, because of this decisional Possible, possible decisional defect. And the other thing they warned about is that the social value of research, this prospect of benefit to society is also uncertain. So if, we, if there's a possible incremental benefit of knowledge gained, we don't know if it will emerge, we don't know how big it is, we don't know what the effect will be. So exposing people to very high risks might not be warranted if the social value doesn't provide a, a um, proportional benefit. So part of this issue about social value is it's hard to predict when you look at an individual protocol what, what the results are going to be or how impactful they, they will be for, for the advancement of science or, or protection of human health. And so part of this is that, as we know, science advances through a whole series of studies on a given topic or with a given intervention. It's not a single protocol or a single trial that can be definitive. And so portfolios of research might give us more of an idea of where social, social value might, might emerge. But even that it ha is, is really, it has a lot of uncertainty embedded within it. And then to, to make things even more complicated, social value doesn't always materialize despite, um, despite the best efforts of scientists and despite investments. So I'll go through this example pretty quickly because I think everybody knows probably that we don't have an effective HIV vaccine. But um, the, part of what's interesting about this is that over the many decades of HIV vaccine research, there's been the hope and the promise that we would have a vaccine in a few years, every few years. So um, there were you know, tens of thousands and in fact millions of deaths that were at issue. The social value, the potential benefit of the vaccine was well recognized in the sense that it could have prevented untold numbers of infections and, and deaths uh, both before the advent of antiretroviral therapy and even afterwards when people don't know, didn't always have access to it. And so in 1998, people were speculating if there would be a vaccine within 10 years um, there was, uh, in that fiscal year, $239 million dedicated by NIH to AIDS vaccine research. 
uh, in 2001, Jose Esparza, who is an HIV research expert, uh, said that a vaccine would be available within the next two to six years. In 2014, um, the lion's share of uh, vaccine research uh, coming from the U.S. at $841 million, uh, still no vaccine. Um, and in 2015, uh, three quarters of all global HIV prevention research was going to vaccine uh, work uh, around the globe and yet no vaccine has emerged. So the point being, despite this massive influx of, of funding and some of the, you know, really the best minds in science are working on this problem, we didn't get the fruits of that research. Um, it didn't emerge uh, in, in a form that actually was an intervention that could save people's lives. So that's part of my caution about <clears throat> the uncertainty of social value when it comes to taking risks. So I want to shift gears slightly, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the structure of research more generally. So we, we raised a couple of objections to the idea of there's no limits on research based on decision making and social value, but there's, there are other reasons that we might that might give us pause. So research, as we know, is a complicated sort of social endeavor. Um, it's uh, consumed significant resources, as we've just seen from the examples I gave. And with these uncertain results, both short-term and long-term, the gains are, uh, in the end, there are gains, but how they will, how and when they will emerge and what, what types of uh, specific, specific research topics and areas uh, will, will be fruitful is, is always highly uncertain. There are ineliminable risks in conducting research. That is, it's, it's not possible to do research with zero risk. So this is, we ask members of society to assume and accept a certain amount of risk in order to uh, basically make the, pro the progress of research viable. And the cooperation of lots of stakeholders. So funders, government agencies, regulatory bodies, et cetera, including of course, volunteers who participate in research who are key stakeholder group that's going to be especially concerned about risks. And there's trust and cooperation amongst the different stakeholders. So it's not only that research volunteers need to trust researchers in order to make a decision to enroll in research, but it's also that these different stakeholders have to have some confidence in each other, that there's a set of norms and standards that have all, that everyone has agreed to. Um, and this consensus among stakeholders is relatively fragile. And by that, I mean that uh, when a controversy breaks out, it is, can be extremely disruptive to the entire process of research. And I can give examples, but I think many of you probably know of examples of when things have gone wrong in research, things grind to a halt and regulatory bodies step in and commissions are convened, et cetera. So several commentators um, have remarked on this kind of the social cooperative structure of research. Um, this quote from Alex John London and Jonathan Kimmelman is about research being a deeply social activity. Uh, it entails a long chain of investigations, each building on the last. Um, uncoordinated activities of individuals pursuing personal interests can have deleterious effects on the attainment and preservation of social goods. Research ethics must place more emphasis on norms that preserve relationships and institutions necessary to sustain this social good. So the idea that the structure of research itself is something that we should pay attention to in research ethics. Um, <clears throat> Joanna Rosinska also comments on the sort of fragile nature of this cooperative structure. Um, the stability and effectiveness in attaining the common good requires normative and institutional mechanisms for balancing the conflicting interests of specific stakeholders. <clears throat> All parties need to be willing to support and invest in the enterprise, and they must be based on values that represent society's vision of the kind of society it wants to be. So then, and again, this is sort of an exhortation to uh, pay attention to norms in research because there has to be some consensus about what those norms are. So not only is this an important research enterprise, but it's also fundamental to social justice. And Alex, John Lennon, and Daniel Wenner have, of course, championed the importance of health research as sort of a morally obligatory function that we need in society to support health and health care. So Daniel Wenner talks about how um, health systems be, being basic structures that impact people's life prospects 
um, need health research to support and contribute to evidence-based uh, mechanisms uh, that, that support the health of populations. So this social value requirement and the requirement to do health research is part of our broader commitment to social justice. So research isn't just a good idea, it's actually obligatory. Um, <clears throat> so this is important when we think about damaging, if we have potentially damaged the structure of research, we're damaging something that we've made a moral commitment to as part of our basic commitment to social justice and health of population. So what does this mean sort of practically in terms of how we think about people participating in research? So there's a lot of studies that have been done of people's attitudes towards research and um, their trust in research or lack of trust in research. And I, I picked this particular study to describe partly because I was interested in how um, the investigator um, deframed um, the qualitative analysis of people's expressions of interest in research. Um, so this is title of this article is why do people cooperate with medical research? And this term cooperation reflects the fact that people uh, in this study expressed their um, reflection and appreciation of the institutional structures that were um, that were underlying the research. Um, so um, there's a couple of representative quotes here. Uh, they they recognized this in the UK, so they they recognized the University National Health System as respected organizations. This for, first participant says the amount of information I received was sufficient for me to make a decision. If it had been from Joe Blogs, you know, bio whatever, I wouldn't have even responded. It would have gone in the bin. It gives it credence. It gives it the stamp of approval. And here's another another participant. Um, talks about the sort of their assumption that they trusted the researchers because of the their belief in the integrity of the, the research process and the professionals who were engaged in research. We assumed it was going to be carried out in a proper fashion, and so it was. The fundamental belief that the vast majority of people who are involved in medicine and its allied professions, I mean research, are dedicated professionals. People who go into that walk of life are doing it because they want to do it, and they're just dedicated. So um, I think one, one thing I'm interested in about these quotes is that it's not that these people evaluated the specific trial that they were they, they were asked to join it's that they evaluated the system and the people in the system as being trustworthy um, and that theme actually shows up in a lot of qualitative research about people's attitudes towards research they want to know if they can trust the people and the institutions that are engaged in research so this issue of public trust is one of the things that comes up when we talk about risky research. And would risky research contribute to increased mistrust? Would it damage this fragile consensus we have about research or not? So thinking about trust and mistrust, again, looking at some more of this qualitative research, um, there are people who've been concerned about uh, distrust among specific populations. We have minority and underserved populations in the United States who um, have good reasons to be mistrustful of the system of healthcare and other uh, other institutional systems. And, um, and there's been a lot of research demonstrating that that mistrust has sort of widespread consequences for how people engage with different parts of the health infrastructure. So um, this quote talks about um, distrust being a sense of fear and skepticism. It's not unique to certain racial or ethnic groups. However, there can be unique historical experiences of racism, discrimination, and unethical, unethical treatment. Certain groups may have experienced this that are, and it's important to note and consider in promoting trust amongst those groups. Um, so it, particularly, as we know in the United States, African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic communities, Asian Americans, um, all, many different groups have experienced these various forms of structural racism, uh, discrimination, and bias uh, in healthcare and in other areas, which then colors how people see these institutions and how they respond to institutions that are doing research. And this um, study was kind of striking. Uh, this was a qualitative study of uh, Black Americans from St. Louis, um, a, a series of focus groups uh, with people of different ages. Um, all African-American participants. And uh, the researchers here expressed that mistrust was an important barrier expressed across all groups, regardless of prior research participation or socioeconomic status. Um, the study illustrates the multifaceted nature of mistrust, 
and suggests it remains an important barrier to research participation. And researchers should incorporate strategies to reduce mistrust and increase participation among African Americans. So there's a couple of quotes here. I won't read all of them. But one of the ones that really struck me is this one on, on the right hand side of the screen, because it has nothing to do with um, health care or even really health research. But it's um, it, it talks about this sort of pleiotropic effect of feeling mistrustful, that you can't trust people to do the right thing in all kinds of situations. So uh, this person says, I sat in the driver's license bureau for about 45 minutes. Every black person that was in there, they'd be like, would you like to be an organ donor? And every black person said no. And every person of another race they asked was like, yeah, no problem. And I immediately said no. And this thing in my mind was telling me, they will misuse my organs. I don't even know why I was so emotional. I, I thought that was just really striking because it, it just shows how mistrust is not necessarily about um, a specific offer of a specific activity, but it's about the feeling that the people in the institutions that are responsible for things like healthcare or handling organs of deceased persons are not trustworthy, can't be trusted. Are, are potentially people who uh, abuse people's uh, trust and goodwill and 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 do the wrong thing. So there's there's also other issues that affect um, people's participation in research that are uh, in some ways related to this idea of mistrust, but also related to just structural inequalities and socio so socioeconomic inequalities and and other types of disparities um, and. Uh, this is also well known to a lot of people in research, but it, it's it's relevant to this idea of people being sort of disenfranchised and not well served in research. Um, so this is an interesting study by uh, researchers who are basically did an anthropologic study of two research sites, one which is a um, a public hospital and one um, that is an academic medical center, and they. Uh, did a sort of ethnographic study of what it was like to be uh, conducting research or being approached to participate in research in these two centers. And they talk about how in the public hospital, which is social hospital, they refer to, um, there were really, there was a lot of limitation in people's ability to engage uh, with the offers of research. Um, there was, a, there were they describe this as sort of limited cultural health capital or limited familiarity with research um, and the providers themselves um, limiting the type of research offers that were made to people because they felt that um, for the public insurance wouldn't provide enough coverage for people, that there would be, there were more important pressing health care needs, that there were sort of limitations in the infrastructure and the, <clears throat> the human capital available to do research in with this more marginalized population, especially in comparison with the academic medical center where potential research participants showed up well-informed, ready to engage with uh, researchers and, and people recruiting for clinical trials sort of as, as equals. Um, so the, the authors talk about the fact that while the, the researchers in general had a commitment to increasing recruitment of minority participants, um, the, the idea of just sort of plopping into this public hospital without any additional support for um, the, the differences in educational background and familiarity and infrastructure that were there um, was basically unfair in their view. So they say, um, ostensibly supporting increased enrollment of minorities, um, the trial sponsors continue to allocate resources for recruitment based on a generic model of a well-educated English-speaking middle-class patient in a well-funded clinic. The Davis Center, that's the academic center, uh, the strategy for including more minorities in clinical research by expanding recruitment at social hospital, absent efforts to address structural and institutional differences, raises questions about the ethical and fair dis distribution of benefits and burdens of participation in therapeutic oncology trials. So, the point being that these disparities in access to research and participation in research depend on a, quite a number of factors that require a concerted effort to, to uh, redress. Um, and so part of it is about trust, but part, is it, part of it is about this sort of infrastructure and, and human capital that is lacking in many places. Um, so 
why we know why this is a problem this is a problem because people need to be represented in research to have their health needs addressed and underrepresented underrepresentation in research research harms these same groups um and underrepresentation also has the potential to harm their access to um to health care generally and we know this is well documented in data from different agencies and, and studies. This is a little bit hard to see, but the second um, chart there shows a um, racial distribution of studies uh, from uh, 2015 to 2019 in drug trials um, at the FDA and the level of representation of minority research participants is, is low and very is much lower than their representation in the population at large, which is not surprising. It's a well-known fact. So, um, so part of the problem here is um, uh, the systemic problems of underrepresentation and lack of trust. And um, so some researchers studying uh, what it means to trust uh, agents or, or entities is talks about these three different components, the fiduciary relationships, competence, the competence and skills and knowledge of, of researchers, um, and perceptions of trustworthiness of researchers or institutions, um, humanistic qualities or virtues such as compassion, altruism, empathy. Uh, these types of qualities can foster trust. So you can see that if we're trying to remediate this problem of underrepresentation and lack of trust and lack of access to research for minority communities, the perceptions of what kind of people researchers are and what kind of uh, institutions our research institutions actually are is going to be critical to both to improve the situation and also to not make it worse. So um, this and then to sum up, this systemic racism and disadvantage creates this divide and and impacts tr uh, trust in, in health care and health research generally. And as I just said, anything that exacerbates this situation, this lack of trust, um, can contribute to a magnification of this injustice. Now, if we engage in, in risky studies, if we allow this sort of a no limit on risk and research, will it contribute to worsening these gaps? I mean, that's an empirical question, right? So it may or may not, but this is the worry is that given the fact that we have um, um, these serious disparities and this serious gap in trust now, anything that does increase mistrust is, is sending us in the wrong direction. So to sum up what I've said so far, there are reasons that other scholars have endorsed uh, for imposing limits on, on risks in research. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, flawed decision-making by volunteers and the uncertainty of social value, those are reasons that have already been raised by a number of scholars. And I agree with those. So I'm not adding anything new. I'm just endorsing the reasons that have been already um, have already been put forward. And people have already mentioned this idea of research as a complex and somewhat fragile social structure, which I agree with. So the part I'm, I'm trying to add is the, this part about diversity in research and how given this, this necessary social cooperation and the ne necessity for people to have some confidence and trust in research institutions, anything that causes a decrement in that trust has potential implications for social justice. So that so basically the argument so far is, yes, I think there should be limits to risk and research. So the next question is, if there are going to be limits to risk and research, how do we decide what they are? So um, one of the things that people have done in trying to think about risk and research is to compare risk and research to other activities that are socially sanctioned. So there's a couple different ways these analogies have been used. In the case of the COVID challenge trials, one of the arguments made was, well, these challenge trials are not actually much riskier than other things that we're going to do. Um, but I'm not going to tackle that one directly because I'm not trying to get into the specifics of the COVID tri challenge trials. I'm trying to talk about what kind of limits we might impose generally as a general matter. So um, a couple of the examples that people give is, well, we we let people become firefighters or first responders, and those are very risky jobs, and they 
uh, things people do for the benefit of others. So there's an element of this contribution to an altruistic endeavor. Um, and, and those are socially acceptable activities. And another example is organ donation. So um, the idea being, well, we don't know exactly what risks are okay in research, but we have these other activities. So maybe we should just say, if the risks aren't greater than these other sanctioned activities, then maybe that's the right limit. So I think there's some problems with these. Um, for the first responder or firefighter example, um, when it comes to highly risky jobs, we allow people to have those jobs. We appreciate that they have them, but we don't really expect everybody to be willing to take highly risky jobs. We, we do believe that research should be accessible to a broad range of people across society. So we don't expect people to have to be heroic and take on heroic risks in order to be in research, generally speaking. So I, in my mind, that's not a, a terrifically great analogy for that reason. Um, there's also problems with the organ donation example. Um, so, and Steve, uh, Frank Miller and Steve Joffe bring this up in their 2009 paper, that uh, in when it comes to organ donations in the context of, of clinical practice, the benefits are are well known, and they're and they're not speculative. People know that if they donate a kidney, it's potentially saving a life of another person, um, and the risks of kidney donation are extremely well characterized. They're not zero, but they're extremely well known, and they're quantifiable. So this is really different from research. It, there's there's no research study that has like a guarantee that you're going to benefit somebody and save their life, um, and there's also not only this sort of uh, you know, statistical um, confidence, but there's also kind of a direct relationship. There's a correspondence of this altruistic act and this outcome, which makes a, a big difference for people. I don't know if it necessarily makes a difference in sort of pure ethical terms, but makes a difference in terms of people's attitudes towards taking risk is I know this is going to benefit someone. So it's worth it to me personally to take this risk and burden. So that's not maybe not a very good example to use as the analogy you want to use to set the level of risks in research at what is the acceptable upper limit. Um, so um, this is just sort of saying the things I just said. Plus, um, there's all there's also the point that there there are occupational limits imposed on people in different jobs, even risky jobs have, there are some limitations imposed. It's not that you can take on any risk at all. Um, so uh, again, is this an analogy for how we um, set limits in, in research? It doesn't really help us decide what the limit should be. Um, so there've been some recent papers on this topic. Um, so Aaron Paquette and Seema Shah wrote a paper about uh, the question of trying to establish limits in, in risk. And so they review these, some various arguments, including these comparator activity arguments. Um, and they, they basically find that most of these are unsatisfactory. Um, they, they come up with an interesting proposal, which doesn't really help us figure out what the limits on risk should be, but actually is a proposal that would help uh, make certain types of risky research more palatable, I think. So their proposal is to that uh, people who engage in uh, research that's of no direct benefit to them for altruistic reasons are making a contribution to society that doesn't receive su su sufficient recognition. So they compare this type of contribution to someone like an astronaut who is putting themselves on the line, potentially, you know, life-threatening situations uh, to advance societal goals, of space exploration or science or other goals, but they're, they're, they receive a lot of recognition and acclaim. They might receive more financial re remuneration. So the, the idea being um, that Peckett and Shaw think that if we um, gave more recognition and more direct benefits in the form of even if we were allowed to count financial benefits as direct benefits to people uh, who participate in risky research, that might um, make these uh, types of research participants more commensurate with these comparators, these you know these other activities that we want to use as comparisons. So it's interesting because rather than saying, um, this will help us establish a limit. 
it helps us um, decide that we can make it okay to take more higher risks in research. Um, I'm I'm not sure I agree with this approach. It's just an, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting point of view. And um, they also talk about the fact that we need better estimates of social value, again, to balance the um, imposition of risks with the ultimate social value of, of the studies. And I think we all agree that that is a point that creates a lot of difficulty for this ethical um, analysis and trade-off uh, to, to take place. So um, I haven't figured out what I actually think about what the limits of risk should be. I think there should be limits. For all the reasons that I mentioned uh, earlier throughout the first part of the talk, I think there should be a, an upper limit on risks for, for research that does not provide direct benefit to study participants. Um, what the limit should be, I don't know. And um, commentators often distinguish between uh, the procedural uh, mechanisms for setting limits, like should there be a, a committee or a process or a commission versus a substantive standard. I think there should be some type of substantive standard, but I think it should have a significant amount of flexibility within it. And to give you an example, um, so Annetta Ridd and Dave Wendler have a framework for analyzing risks and benefits in research. And in this, this paper, they talk about the need for an upper limit on risks, and but also mentioning that beneath that, uh, that limit of, you know, when you're within the acceptable range of risks, you would still have a balancing and a titration of, of the level of risk with the level of benefit, whether it's clinical benefit or social value benefit, that's still relevant. So you still have to do some balancing. You still have to do some justification for the amount of risk that is imposed, even when you, you're within the acceptable range. And I agree with that. And I, so I think there's still gonna be room for a lot of consideration about what risk is the appropriate level when you're in a, a zone that's not excessively highly risky. But how to determine that limit? Um, I, I haven't come up with what I actually think about that. I Maybe some of you have, you know, we'll have some ideas in the discussion. So um, just to sum up, um, as I mentioned, I, I agree with the commentators who say that um, health research is basically a morally obligatory uh, uh, activity. It's needed to address the health of populations. Um, and I do think that highly risky research um, that, you know, that, that it poses significant risks without any prospect of benefit to the volunteers jeopardizes research because of this fragile social consensus we have about how we can bring stakeholders together with a set of norms and a set of agreed upon standards. Um, the, I, I also think this, this idea that we can predict high social value from individual studies is, is likely to be um, a hopeless enterprise. I don't think that's something that we'll be able to solve because uncertainty is just built into the nature of research. And um, this uh, problem of the erosion of trust and the potential um, decrement in people's willingness to engage with research when they're already facing an accumulation of mistrust and, and disenfranchisement, to me, is, is yet one more reason on top of these other reasons why um, highly risky research is a bad idea. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, look forward to questions and comments. All right. Do we have any questions in the room or online? Yeah, Joe. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It's super interesting. And I just had this thought on my mind as you were presenting on the last slide. So I just wanted to ask it and see if you heard, heard it a few minutes ago. I was just wondering if anyone considered insuring against the risk? Uh, for like ensuring the participants so that if they have negative consequences from say a challenge trial, then they would receive associated benefits because because uh, it seems like if you couldn't get an insurer to cover that, then it seems like maybe we shouldn't do it at all, right? But if you could, then then there is a, a, a sort of a cushion of potential trust mechanism. So I, I just sort of curious if anyone had been considers sort of that avenue of using insurance mechanisms as a way of mitigating these risk-based considerations um, to sort of 
deal with these high risk contacts. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting question. So there is such a thing as clinical trials insurance. And in fact, you know, countries other than the US, it's actually uh, often required. So um, that doesn't necessarily tell us that the risks are acceptable. It just tells us that somebody's willing to pay out. <laughs> so I'm not sure if it helps us answer the ethical question. It could possibly, um, you know, help us address the question of people's willingness to engage. But um, I think part of the part of the concern I would have is that the kinds of risks that are you were most worried about are the serious and irreversible harm and death. <laughs> and you know, so paying out isn't gonna fix those, right? It might help your family members. Um, but um yeah, I think it's um, you know, and, and then we have as many in the room know, I'm sure we have the problem in the United States of we don't have a policy of compensation for injury and research at a federal level, which has created a lot of problems throughout the whole course of clinical research in this country. But that I see that as somewhat of a separate issue, uh, partly because that compensation for injury issue really cuts across all types of research, not just super risky research. And, and also combined with the fact that the fact that we have Examples of clinical trials insurance in other countries, we know that that's a thing. It can it can work, but it doesn't solve this sort of moral or ethical problem about when is it an excessive risk that we've asked somebody to take, even though we're covering them with with compensation. And I hope I've answered your question. I guess one last thing, which is that if if you can get insurance, that might be a standard for like if if someone can't evaluate the risk well enough to insure against it, then that might provide a, at least one pra pragmatic standard where like you wouldn't be able to, if you had, if you required insurance and then couldn't get insurance on the experiment and then it wouldn't go through. And so it seems like there's at least this sort of way of, of using insurance-based thinking to deal with this risk space. So. Oh yeah, well, so that's interesting. So one of the things I put in my, you know, very tentative criteria about limits is that, um, you know, people think about probability and magnitude of harm, um, but there's also the, you know, the uncertainty or the confidence interval around those estimates. And so I do agree that one important, I would put the criterion slightly differently from the way you did, but it's going getting at the same issue, which is about what, how much do we know about the risk? And if you just don't know enough, then that's a reason to say it's in the too high a risk category, it even when the risk in the end might not be as high as, as you potentially thought, but you have too little information. And in fact, that was one of the things we put in our short commentary about COVID, the COVID challenge trial situation was we don't know much about COVID and especially not in 2020. Um, and so the not knowing much is part of the criteria for giving us pause. And then, you know, of course, how do you decide when you know enough, right? So there's there's that, but certainly the difference between, one of the examples that I like to give is that like in our institute, we do malaria challenge trials. I, I think they're perfectly reasonable from an ethical point of view. And I think the COVID challenge trials in 2020 was not reasonable based on this lack of knowledge. We know a ton of stuff about malaria, all, you know, all aspects of it, treating it, preventing it, uh, pathology, course of disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a difference of knowledge is, is part of the part of the thing. So thank you. Thanks, Liza. <clears throat> Good talk. Thank you. Um, I was surprised that you didn't include the nature of the risk. So you had probability and magnitude, but I think some of the issues you're facing are troubles understanding what the nature of the risk might be. So there are certain kinds of research where you're going to know the risk of X is Y, right? So the risk of death is this. The risk of pain is this. The risk of headache is this. The risk of a rash is this. All of those are risks, but the nature of those risks can differ quite substantially, regardless of their magnitude and duration. So I think getting at part of the issue with, say, the COVID one was the uncertain risks that we, we didn't know and risk to others. But... Can you say more about why you're not including a delineation of nature of risks? Yeah, well, that's a great question. 
um, I haven't gotten very far on this problem, <laughs> but the, um, I mean, so the first two criteria, uh, you know, I think I have on there somewhere <laughs> um, is um, the thre threshold of, you know, for risk of death and ir irreversible serious harm. That's got to be on the list of things you've got to be concerned about, right? There's other things you have to be concerned about. Um, but the question here, if those are risks, the question is what percentage, you know, what probability level is too high, right? Because, and this is one of the problems with our legalistic culture is that there's all kinds of research that will have a consent form that says there's a risk you could have anaphylactic shock and that might be life-threatening and blah, 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 with something that where the risk is infinitesimally small, <laughs> but it's still on there as, you know, something. And so at what level, what, you know, probability level and with what certainty level do we just say that's too much risk? So that's the problem with even the things that we recognize are seriously bad things. And then I agree with you. It, it makes a lot of sense to think about the other types of risks and how we might try to evaluate them. For example, you could have serious harm that's not completely irreversible, but it takes years <laughs> to be reversed. So it's, a, you know, sort of a qualies and dollies type of thing. How much, you know, how much of your life are you giving up for the experience of this, this burden of the potential harm? Those are, those are all relevant. Um, so I think there's both a practical side of trying to think through what the risks are. And then again, there's this kind of ethical piece of how are you going to set thresholds? And I don't think any of the mechanisms that have been proposed for setting thresholds are very helpful yet. So uh, I push you just a little bit on this. I think it might be worth exploring the nature of the risks of the things that could happen in this research. What are the types of risks, right? And each of those may be qualitative, qualitatively different and quantitatively different, right? So if you had a, a risk of a headache, right? Or then a severe headache, right? And I know you want to set an upper level, but you, you, in order to do that, you're going to have a spectrum of things that might happen within the course of, of the research, right? One of them, like you pointed out, would be death. Others would be severe pain, a stroke, any number one of these things. And I think you could set upper limits, not on each one of those, right? So each resource, each kind of research activity is going to have a different uh, portfolio of risks. And that portfolio would need to be assessed in aggregate. It's not that only one bad thing can happen in the research setting. No, absolutely. No, that's absolutely right. And and I think that look looking in detail at that catalog of risks would be helpful. Um, it's it's one part of the puzzle. But I as I say, I haven't gone very far down into the weeds mm -hmm. on this. But thank you for the question. Oh, we're gonna take one online and then Yes, so we do have one comment in the chat from Travis. He says, I wonder if another of the differences between risk analogies also matters for establishing upper limits, and that is something like who is imposing the risk. The thing about challenge trials that worries me is that if someone says dies from COVID after being exposed to COVID in a challenge trial, the research straightforwardly killed them in a way different from when a standard trial risk materializes. The research gave them COVID, which we knew would kill them, and it killed them. Uh, if the government funds the research, then it's worse. The government killed the subject with its research. So yes, I know people die in research, so that's a risk of research in a sense, but it's not one of the things that our intervention standardly does. Um, and he said, thank you for such an engaging talk. So I had a little trouble hearing that last part. Can you read the, like, the last? Just every other word. Yeah, read every other no. word. No, can you read? Just yes. the last the last sentence, because I didn't I, it, yes. it's a little hard to hear. So he said, so yes, I know people die in research, so that's a risk of research in a sense, but it's not one of those things that our intervention standardly does. Um, he said, not sure if this makes sense in such a compressed format, but just a thought. Thank you for such an engaging talk. Okay, so I, I think what the what the comment is saying is then the difference between um, a risk of dying from a health intervention that was designed to help you versus a risk of dying from uh, an experimental infection that 
you knew had a certain risk and it had no therapeutic benefit for you at all. Is that is that the gist of the question? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's it really kind of gets to this point about. Um, I'm probably going to just go all the way back to the beginning here. Um, it goes back to this difference between these two graphs, right? Like, so you, I mean, diagrams. <laughs> so in the, in this one, you have potential direct benefit to people from a health intervention or some type of intervention. And then you have some <clears throat> risks and burdens to people. And so in clinical care or in clinical research, you're balancing, uh, you know, the benefits of the clinical intervention with the risks. And in research, you may have some additional research related risks that are separate but but i think what the commenter is pointing out that in this scenario there wasn't any attempt to benefit people at all it was simply imposing a risk and and that and then if there's a bad outcome um you know it it i think the commenter is is saying it's you essentially said the sponsors of the trial or the researchers have effectively killed somebody um, for no for no good reason, right? It wasn't it wasn't that you were trying to help them and and the, the intervention went awry, which is I think the kind of worry that we have is that um, although we want to get the social value, uh, the benefit of knowledge gained, sometimes that high price can just see, seem morally unacceptable to us that we were trying to get knowledge and when somebody had to make that level of a sacrifice for the benefit of knowledge, whereas if they had gotten the benefit of, you know, it was an attempt to treat them clinically, then it's a different moral equation. Um, I hope that sort of answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I hesitate. I, I, hesitate. I hesitate to, but it's very risky to sort of try to guess what Travis would want to say next. So I don't know if he's responded, but I think it's even a stronger point, Liza, than the general point about if you're in a trial with no prospect of direct benefit, the fact that something bad happens to you is not offset by the prospect that you might have directly benefited. I think he wants to make the stronger argument that in the, co the proposed COVID challenge trials, people were being injected with something that it was known could kill them, right? Even though we weren't sure of the likelihood at that point of a young person actually succumbing to a COVID infection. And that's different, right? Somehow morally different than a situation in which you enter a trial, even one for which there is no prospect of direct benefit, where there is a small chance of death uh, and that death materializes than one in which the, you know, the, the scenario is, is so different as it was in the, in the COVID challenge trials. I think it's something like that. I'm not expressing it. Uh, I think exactly as Travis would, but it's something like that that I think he's getting at. It's even stronger. It's yeah, and I challenge trial. Thank you. That's no, that's really helpful. Yeah, and I and I think um, part of that's that I think that is exactly part of the reason that um, those trials were those proposed trials are so controversial. Is um, is this, there's there are knowns and then there's uh, there's unknowns in terms of risks and uh we 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 always have a certain you know a certain level of unknown about something bad could happen and just as you say in a trial that's not therapeutic or no, no clinical benefit something bad could happen and we have to allow for that possibility but in this case yes there was a it was a known risk and so yes that uh, to me that is part of um part of what makes that scenario problematic and um the there's a question about again about if you know there's that threshold of you know it's some probability people could die what is the threshold that's that's impermissible because in point of fact the problem part of the problem with it is that in any with any intervention there's some probability of something going wrong and you you know usually it's just extremely low um, but it's not zero so um it, 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 where does the probability rise up to the level where we say it's sort of an intentional exposure to a risk of death versus it's a possible exposure to a risk of death that we don't think is going to materialize, 
So I don't know if I'm trying to split hairs, but I do see that there's a difference when you know there's a defined probability there. Um, I don't know if I, I guess that time. is. Yeah, I think you're the last question. Great. Um, thanks, Liza. It's really interesting. I, I'm wondering, I'll try to keep it brief so we'll kind of respond, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are more disanalogies with the high-risk occupations might be that we typically train those individuals significantly and equip them significantly to handle the risk and to mitigate and minimize it, things like that. Whereas in research that almost exists exclusively in other people's hands, you know, there's some amount of common knowledge people may have, but they don't, they're, and there are probably things they could do to minimize the occurrence of side effects or things like that, right? But, but we don't necessarily put energy into training research participants in that kind of way. Um, because in part, we want to monitor those side effects and the harms and know what's actually going to happen when we give people these medications or whatever it might be. So I wonder if that has anything to do with this. I mean, I know you do some work community engagement too, like whether there are path connections over to that in some ways to kind of increase the capacity of participants, particularly in community-based research to handle these risks. But anyway, I'm wondering if, you have, if that makes sense, any thoughts? Yeah, thanks. A great point. I mean, I think, you know, what I would say about the sort of training to handle risks is, oh, we train the research personnel to handle the risks, right? right. So it's, we, there is extensive training, lots and lots of training. You know, how do you handle adverse events? When do you stop the drug? What do you, when do you call, you know, for medical, right. uh, you know, medical intervention? But it's a difference of agency, right? So right. You, the person themselves is not in charge of that management of the risk. Whereas, yeah, it's a great point. If you're in a situation where you, um, you know, you're trained to fight fires or to jump out of airplanes or whatever you do, you, you're you trained to take care of yourself. However, I, I, I also think there is an institutional structure around every occupation that takes some of the agency away from people, that they, you know, they have a set of rules and a set of governing, you know, procedures that they don't, you know, they sort of have to sign on to, um, you know, in its entirety and to, to some extent, but yeah, there is a big difference in agency though. And I, and I appreciate that. I think it's definitely yeah, relevant. I think it might, might be linked also to trust. You know, I don't know if there's work on that research showing links between agency and trust um, at the individual level, but it, it may be worth exploring more. That's a great point, definitely. I'll just make one last link back to trust, which is the point that Travis and Ruth were making as well, that if it is the trial itself or the funder, which is the government, that has larger implications for trust as well, I would think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I think we, we also see from the qualitative research that people often link things back to the government, yeah. <laughs> whether or not they are directly connected. but you know, it, in in a lot of health research, as we all know, there is a, a, a component of that that is a, someone at a very high level decided we're going to do this. And that that's significant too. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. Let us all thank Dr. Dawson.